Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Our guest today, Norman Jordan. He is the color commentator for Vanderbilt football. Today's episode is sponsored by the Well Coffee House, which turns coffee into water. The Well is a coffee house with a mission to bring clean water to the world. To date, over 30 communities across the globe have access to safe water, health, and hope. You too can make an impact by visiting a Well Coffee House location today. You can find those in Brentwood, Green Hills, downtown, and Bellevue. You can find more information at wellcoffeehouse.org. The Well Coffee House where coffee changes lives. We also thank our co-sponsor, Wellspire, Nashville's Learning and Development Center, which is located in the Gulch. Today's news presented by Sutherland and Belk, a local injury law firm committed to helping those who have been injured in accidents. If you or someone you know has been in a wreck or other accident, reach out to Sutherland and Belk and see what your rights are. You can find their contact info online at sbinjurylaw.com. Vanderbilt has released its depth chart. It has seven co-starter positions listed, one being quarterback where Deuce Wallace and Riley Neal are listed in that order. Our guest line brought to you by Bowen Branch, started by Vanderbilt graduates Scott and Missy Tannen. I've slept on Bowen Branch sheets for years. They are amazing. They are also fair trade certified. That means they're made under safe conditions by men and women, treated and paid fairly. Try them for a month. You can return them for free, but you won't want to. If you get the sheets, try the mattress. That was voted best mattress of 2018. Go to BowlinBranch.com. That's spelled B O. OLL, enter the promo code Vandy to get $50 off your first set of sheets. Norman Jordan joins us now. He, of course, was a guest for us all last season during football season. He's the color commentator for Vanderbilt football on the radio. He was also a running back at Vanderbilt and caught a bunch of passes for the 1982 Hall of Fame Bowl team. Norman, thanks for joining us. How are you doing? Oh, doing great, Chris. Thanks for having me. Thank God football's here. Yeah. Yeah. I labored through the uh, Florida-Miami game, but it was just good to have it back. For entertainment value, that was really something. It really was. A lot of mistakes, though, and which you're going to see early in the year, except for the very, very best teams. But a lot of mistakes. Uh, it, it, they, they looked really rusty to me. I mean, Quarterbacks were slow on the reads, and the defensive backs were fooling them with what they were doing in behind. So it was interesting to watch. Let's talk Vandy. What are your thoughts on this team heading into the season? Uh, you know, when you've got an opening schedule like they've got, it's it's kind of get through the best that you can get through. I mean, you've got number three, Georgia, then you've got to go up to Purdue playing a place I don't, I don't think Vanderbilt's ever played there. They certainly haven't since I've been around the program. And then you got LSU coming into town. So you're, you're really going to learn more about your team in the first three games than you learned about it through spring practice and uh, preseason practice. Norman, we've got a bunch of questions. So I'm just going to go ahead and dive into our mailbag, which is sponsored by Vanderbilt Fan an independent insurance agent, Josh Minton of Brentwood. Do you need an insurance agent who wants to know your unique needs and circumstances and will tailor an insurance plan to fit them? Josh is your guy. Call him 615-933-1979. Email him at josh at hqinsurance.com. Follow him on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash JD Minton HQ. He's my agent. Give him a shot, and I think you'll be pleased. Conluck says... What does the depth chart say to you? And Norman, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it yet. You may not have. Vanderbilt released it today. And it has got eight or situations, including starting quarterback, uh, including starting long snapper. It lists a lot of places, four players at positions where they normally list two, maybe three. Uh, I think to say the least, it did not lend a lot of clarity. Yeah, I, I guess it's just keep Georgia confused. I don't know what the, the deal is with that. But, you know, you, you can tell quite a bit from looking at the depth chart. First of all, how many snaps have the linemen taken? That, that's really big. Uh, secondly, you look at, you know, Vanderbilt's got really, really three great offensive weapons this year. Uh, and I don't even think I need to say who they are because I mean, they're really that much better. 
So what can you do in the game to uh, let those turn those guys loose? And so you know that. So then if you look at the depth chart, who else, if you've got all these guys that can run and catch, who can get deep? And that's what you want to find out on Saturday is, is can you get somebody deep and keep the uh, defenses honest? I got asked this question, or actually Willie Donick got asked this question this morning on a podcast that I did with Willie. And the question was, has Vanderbilt ever had a threesome like Vaughn, Pinckney, and Lipscomb in its history? And we couldn't think of one. I mean, the closest I can think of was maybe Matthews, Boyd, Zach Stacy. Your Hall of Fame Bowl team had some pretty good players on that too, although you guys spread the work out a little bit more. My answer would be, I think this is clearly the best trio of playmakers Vanderbilt has ever had. No, I, I, I don't think there's any question. I mean, somebody asked me in the off season, which thank goodness I can say in the off season now because we're the season's here. But uh, somebody asked me, said, um, you know, do you think he, uh, that Vaughn is the greatest running back at Vanderbilt? I said, well, you know, he's still got another year to go. But I've never seen anybody that can do the things that he can do. And then you got, you know, you got the other guys. You got Pinkney, you got Kalijah. Uh, they, they've really got some tools, but it, it's how do you use them? I mean, I, I don't want to put Vaughn running in the middle of the line just to get the linebackers to beat up on him. I want him in there to make me some yardage or to be a decoy and then get the ball to the other guys. Pinkney, I want him going in behind the linebackers, keeping the linebackers honest. So they can't come just rushing up and, and tackling Vaughn. And then Kalaja, you know, it, it, I remember I was watching at a preseason practice and going, he doesn't run particularly fast. He doesn't run particularly great routes. He just gets it all done. There's not something you can just say, wow, this, this kid is this. He just he gets it done. When you've got three guys like that on the field at once, not to mention some other kids that I like, like Cam Johnson and some of their receivers, I don't think that you can really afford to double cover a team like that, can you, in any spot? Well, you know, if you look at the recent history of the way defenses are playing, basically what we're going to see is there's going to be seven or eight men in the box. And and I think if you're Georgia – you're going to see eight men in the box because you're going to stop the run first because you've got two quarterbacks that you don't know, you know, how they're going to perform. So you're going to make sure that Vaughn's not the one that kills you and see if you can do something with the other guys. Just keep a closer eye on the two really good players and kind of, kind of watch the other players and make sure nothing big happens. And you can make things happen. Yeah. I, I would have to think that, not that those three aren't really good players, if not great players, but Vaughn, I think, is the guy that anybody would be most concerned about. You have to be. I mean, in the SEC, if if you don't stop the run, you get beat. And so you have to make sure that Vaughn's not going to beat you. He's going to get some yards, uh, but what you've got to do with him is, you know, frankly, keep him from bouncing it outside. If, if I were a defensive coordinator, I wouldn't be as concerned as what my linebackers do. I'd be more concerned about what the outside linebackers and the corners do or the defensive ends do, depending on what the, the front is. But you make sure that he doesn't bounce it out because that's where he makes his really big runs. He kills you when he bounces it out and then that speed takes over. If I'm Jerry Godowski, I'm getting him the ball a lot in the screen game. Well, then you must be Jerry Godowski because I think it's, you're going to see a lot of that. And he's got good hands. Uh, I, I think I don't know this. I'm, I'm just going from experience, but I think the reason you didn't see a lot of him in the early games last year is because he didn't really understand the pass protection game, or and I don't I want to say doesn't understand it, but it, it, he just wasn't as effective as somebody else. So we got a, a sure passing situation. So let's put the other guy in. But this year, you know he knows the passing game. You know he knows who to pick up and all that. So there's not a problem with having him in there with that. I just don't really, frankly, want him in there trying to be the Eddie George of Vanderbilt and just 
and running up the middle and running up the middle until the linebackers give out because the linebackers won't give out on him. His, his key is getting out in the open and, and his speed. Mr. Vandy wants to know which of Vanderbilt's position groups concerns you the most. You know, uh, going into the season, the cornerbacks did. Uh, I don't think so. After watching a couple of practices, uh, they they look like they got the concepts, and they look like they're ready for that. Um, that, that that's a really good question. I I guess at this point you'd have to say the offensive line because you don't know what's going to happen until the game starts. I mean, what are the matchups? And that's that's really what football is at the end of the day is can this guy flip that guy? And if he can't, then what can I do to adjust to it? Vandy V with a strategy question here. With the defense as strong as George's and an unproven offensive line, would it be a good idea to go to four and at times five wides set spread to thin out George's defense and perhaps use our most experienced and physical wide receivers, tight ends, and running backs to be used advantage in space and also give the mobile quarterbacks a chance to make a play with their legs? Well, I, I think it's a great point, um, not so much from the standpoint of who your personnel is, but well, I think what you're going to see this year is you're going to see the, the Gadowski put the players, put the quarterbacks, in situations where they can go, well, the pass isn't there, so I'm going to run. And, you know, w- with these guys, you can roll out right, roll out left, and still get four or five yards, which is just as good as any running play you're going to run. Uh, so if, if you've got that going, then you can turn those guys loose. Uh, so, you know, I'm not sure you can outsmart Kirby Smart by putting your, your personnel out there because – He's a pretty darn good defensive coordinator, but uh, you, you can make sure you know what he's trying to protect. And I, I, I would expect that's what uh, Coach Kodowski will be doing is trying to find out where Kirby thinks his weak points are. And Arbordor says, do you have friends who played for Georgia? And if so, how do you talk about the game? Strictly X's and O's a wager of some sort, trash talk, et cetera. Now, I know you do have one dear friend who played for Georgia. I will let you talk about that here. Yeah, no, I, I, I do. Uh, John Lastinger was the quarterback for Georgia uh, with Herschel, and then the year after, and I'm pretty sure the year after, he was the MVP at the uh, Totten Bowl. Uh, one of the finest people I know, just loved him to death. It's a wonderful human being. The first night we met, we sat down and, we talked about the uh, 1980. This was probably 2006. We talked for three hours about the 1982 Vanderbilt Georgia game, and the, the amount of details that both of us remembered is kind of sickening. Uh, just, uh, and, and I guess that's one thing I will say right now is that's one thing I, I wish that we had more of in college football that the, the players from the each team could learn and, and get to know the other players. I, I really wish that could happen, but, you know, I don't think it's ever going to happen. But I, I find John to be one of the most refreshing human beings I've ever known. And as a matter of fact, we're going to have him on the pregame show. He's coming up for the game. We're going to have him on the pregame show, and we're going to try to get together before the game. And uh, just just a you know wonderful person. How do we talk about trash talk? You know, if, if, you know, if you're a Vanderbilt football player, you don't try to talk a Georgia football player. <laughs> but no, I, I, and last year when we went down and played them down there, I got to go spend about 30 minutes at the uh, tailgate with the 82 Georgia football team. Uh, a lot of them, Herschel wasn't there, but a lot of the guys were there. And they were just so congenial and so wonderful and so nice. And no, there, there's no trash talking. You lived in Athens a while. I guess Herschel's probably still like a god down there. He should be. <laughs> yeah, he was one when he played. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I was thinking about it today. I was, I was thinking, you know, Jake Fromm's really got a legitimate chance to be the best quarterback to ever play in Georgia. And I think, he, I think he may very well wind up being the best quarterback to play there. And that's saying a lot. But when you talk about the running backs at Georgia, 
you talk about who might be number two, because there's no question of who number one was. And, and I count it a privilege to have been able to play against Herschel, even if I never was on the field at the same time he was there. He's just, in my mind, the greatest player ever. Well, Jake Fromm being the best quarterback George has ever had is kind of a scary thought. And I think you, you may be right, but I was looking this up. Georgia's got five guys who got some sort of preseason, preseason All-American honor. Now, that does include the kicker, uh, so that's you know maybe a little different. I don't know that the difference between an All-American kicker in the field is as great as it is you know a lot of other positions. But five is five. Uh, and then Jake Fromm was not one of those guys. So that's how talented this team is. Well, I, I think it's more a reflection of, of how balanced the team is, isn't it? from maybe the best quarterback ever play there. This is a really balanced Georgia team. I mean, they run the ball really well, and they throw the ball really well. They got through for 67% completion percentage last year. That's not really bad. That's, that's great. So, you know he can complete the passes, but they, they mix like they've never mixed before. Eric Zyre broke all the records back in the day, but – they were just throwing them all, all over the place, and, and the record wasn't that great. But if you look at what, what uh, Jake Fromm's done, it's a marvelous record. It's a marvelous balance. It's a really good football team that's had a legitimate chance to win two national championships. On the subject of quarterbacks, HMHS asks, have you ever seen a quarterback... I knew that was coming. <laughs> have you ever seen a quarterback... Receiver pairing that reminds you of yourself and Whit Taylor. Oh gosh, you know <laughs> another great question. I, I frankly, I've, I've never thought about it. Uh, I mean, Whit and I, when we we would go on the road or even home games, we'd go to the hotel. Whit and I roomed together from from uh, sophomore year through senior year. And, and nobody else, no other non-position room together. I mean, we were the only running back quarterback uh, room again just because we were just such great friends. We'd become friends in high school. Um, ah, I mean, no, I, it never crossed my mind. Uh, now, I, I really can't come close to thinking about – and we, we were just I, – I felt like we were on the same page all the time. So, you know, I, I'm not equipped to, to answer that, but uh, wonderful question. <laughs> Maybe Wick could answer it. Let me ask you this. Somebody asked me who I compared Deuce Wallace to, and I dropped a Wit Taylor comp. Do you think that is an accurate comparison? I think it could be, and I, I think I see a lot of that in Deuce. Uh, the thing that Whit had that you you just can't coach was he had that game when when the game was on he was there and he would make it happen and he, he would do something even if it was unexplainable he would do something that would make the difference in the game and, and that's really what Whit had and you know that that's a lot of what Vanderbilt's facing this season, they've got to find out those guys that have that ability to make something good happen. As I saw Derek say one time, when when one of his uh, defensive backs got a position, he said, that's exactly where you you want to be now, become a football player. You know, what, what can you do? Can you become a football player when it's not just like it was coached? The Uperior asks... What were some memories from the Hall of Fame Bowl as it relates to Legion Field and other off-the-field events? And he specifies banquets, hotel, swag bag, et cetera. Did you guys even get swag bags back you know, then? I, I, <laughs> I, I am the absolute wrong person to ask about this because what happened is we went home for Christmas and I was out in my front yard, or my mom and dad's front yard, uh, running sprints. And it was a rainy day, and I, I pulled a hamstring. So I get down to Birmingham, and I, I can barely walk. So I spent the whole week with Doc Priest, our old weight coach, stretching out my left hamstring. 
to the point where we were pretty sure until the day of the game that, that my backup was going to be the starter. And then the day of the game, miraculously, it all came around. So I spent no time doing anything with the team or whatever. I mean, I, I was just, I was out. It, it was uh, not my finest hour. Who was your backup? It was uh, uh, Jeff Holt. Okay. From Gallup. He was going to back me up, and uh, I still kind of feel bad about it. I've seen from time to time I feel bad about it because it was going to be his chance to shine, and then all of a sudden he's practiced all week, and they've gotten ready, and all of a sudden I go like, well, uh, yeah, I can go. So (laughs) I, I still feel bad about that to this day. And instead, you so went no, out and caught, it, what, like 20 it, passes? I, I rem- yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, kind of weird. But, yeah, that, that's what happened. But, um, yeah, I, I still, I don't know. It's just one of those things that you just show up and good things happen. And I showed up and good things happened. Yeah, it's just Air Force made sure that we were throwing under instead of throwing across the top because that's what happened the week before or the game before we just threw over the top to Phil and Chuck and, uh, you know, we killed them that way. So they said, we're just going to make them work their way down the field. So we just worked their way down the field. Yeah. But that's still like a, a catch every three minutes and, and you don't have the ball half the time. So <laughs> that's, that's a lot of catches, man. Is that still yeah, speaking of which I go ahead. Is that still, uh, no, it's, it's it's not a bowl record. It's uh, because they shut out all bowls. I think from 1999 before they changed the rules, but uh, it is still the most catches in a bowl. Uh, that, but some guy from LSU had 19 catches for 340 yards, and like, well, I'm not worthy of that. But no, it's wow. uh Phil Roach, who had a had a big game um, against Tennessee the week before. Uh, it's going to be the pastor at my older daughter's wedding this October. So just the one that plugged for Phil. Very nice. Uh, last one, Dorking says, best player you faced in a non-conference game. Now, I'm pretty sure Herschel Walker is the best that you faced in a game, period. It, but it, if you send that it, to out-of-conference... No, I, I had it the second she said it. Bruce Smith. Oh, okay. You got to play against and, Bruce Smith. Well, I, I that's probably, easy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I got to play against Bruce Smith. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. It was really good. Lots of fun. <laughs> six, what was he? Six, six, 306 pounds at the time. Yeah. And so I think I've told the story on here before. Bruce was lined up inside of me, and we're going to do a rollout last. So I, all I got to do is ceiling. And basically, just make sure he doesn't get outside of me. And I look at him going, that's really big. And Monica was the left tackle, and I knew Monica would get into him. And I thought, well, I'm just going to hit him with all I got and just hope I don't break his ribs. And so I hit him with everything I've got and bounced off of him. He's, I, to this day, he doesn't know I hit him. And he's a freshman, I'm a senior, and I almost apologized to him. But I caught myself just in time. Yeah, what was this? He, he was great. He was, he was. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what, what was this? The game? Scouting? No, the scouting report. Okay, I've forgotten. I remember you guys playing him once. I was thinking that was after you were gone, but you guys yeah. did beat them up pretty badly, I think, in 82. Was he on that team? Yeah. Okay. We, we, he was on that team. He was a freshman. Uh, he, he was unbelievable. They had two 300-pound linemen, uh, which was unheard of at the time. And, and we wound up beating, beating them 45 to nothing. Uh, just one of those freaks where freaks of what happens in the world where uh, we've had about five passes got tipped up in the air that could have easily been interceptions. And they didn't get them. And it, it's just one of those days where everything went our way and Nothing went their way. We, they were the number one defense in the country when they came here, and they, they were not when they left. And this is like game 10, I think, or 9. 
Was that a situation where even as a freshman, you spent a lot of time talking about him in the scouting report and he was already a big deal to that point? I mean, it's hard to dominate as a freshman defensive lineman at major, high major college football, but not everybody's Bruce Smith. Yeah, no, I, we, we were cognizant. I mean, we knew that they had these two giants in there, and we knew that Smith, I mean, the, the guy ran a four five forty. So, I mean, we knew he was a freak, but, you know, he hadn't had enough games to where we're like, oh, my gosh, this guy's going to be in the NFL Hall of Fame. But it, it was not one of those things where you, you're playing against a guy that's uh, like Mike Cooper up at Tennessee that, that's a senior he, I think Mike was like six five, two forty five, or something like that, and he could run with anybody. And we go like, uh, okay, so what do we do here, Coach? It wasn't one of those where you knew so much about him because there's a long history. So it was just, uh, you know, like I said, it was when I hit him, I knew what I was up against, and it's like, oh my gosh. Norman, we're out of questions. Is there anything about this game in particular or about the season that you think is worth discussing before we end the show tonight? I, I think that the one thing I would say, and I've, I've been thinking a lot about it, and I'm sure a lot of people have, about the quarterback situation and the offensive line situation. And, I, and the quarterback situation, to me, I think it will work itself out. I, I don't know who's going to start. Um, I have an idea, but I don't know. But... Um, yeah, I, I think what you're looking at is who's who's going to get it done on this day. Who who's got the clock going on in their head that they can take care of the defense and know when to get rid of the ball. And you know, if you've got two guys that come out of camp that are pretty much dead even, then yeah, you, you need to look over your shoulder because it, it may not be happening for you. And you know, quarterback to me, and I, I spent very little bit, very little time at playing quarterback. But quarterback to me was more like basketball where some days you have it and some days you don't. And those days that you don't, you better be prepared to have somebody come in and see if they've got it. And and, and going back to Whit one more time, I mean, I still remember when he got his first chance of Van Heflin got knocked out. Their second team quarterback, Jeff Swab came in and got knocked out the next play and Whit got put in and all of a sudden, we're playing down at Auburn and quit made just the four touchdowns. We still lost, but all of a sudden we're going, hey, uh, this guy can play. And that's what they're going to face a lot this year is we've got three or four guys we know that are really good. Now who else can play? Norman, thanks for joining us. We look forward to doing one of these again next week. Thank you, Chris. I always enjoy it. He's Norman Jordan, the color commentator for Vanderbilt Football. I'm Chris Lee. Thank you for listening to the Vandy Sports Podcast.